I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, linguist Mark Ogren to the show. Welcome to the show because we are so excited. We've been doing this for the past couple of months of just celebrating Atlantis overall <laughs> since it's almost been 20 years. So to speak to somebody who is one of the, I guess we would call you an inspiration for Milo Thatch <laughs> in the or film the too. <laughs> It was really interesting to find some past interviews, and I think um, Milo's head animator was talking about how he would use some sketches of you. Do you remember this at all? Or I rem- What I remember is I was out there uh, at Disney in Burbank, and they said, you should meet the animator for Milo. I said, okay. So he was in his room, and they told me before I went in to not be surprised if while he was talking to me, he was sketching all the time. <laughs> and and he was like and I did not see any of his sketches. I don't know what he was drawing, but the entire time we were talking, we talked for half an hour or something. He was drawing sketches. Yeah. So you never got to see these sketches at all? I never got to see the particular ones he was doing then, right? <laughs> we'll have to ask John if he still has them because that would be so cool to see. <laughs> yeah, it says it says on the internet somewhere that that Milo was designed after me. I don't think that's really accurate. The character of Milo was designed before I showed up on the scene, but maybe he was modified after me or something. I don't know. Most of the crew that have worked on this film are, as they said in in the documentaries and different interviews, they're all big fans of Star Trek. So to get to work with you was like so exciting. Most of our listeners are probably going to remember that you did the Klingon language for Star Trek. So with all of these fascinated animators who are all fans of Star Trek, and I am too they they were really excited to work with you and have you on board to create this new language so before we jump into that about how you were able to flesh out the city of atlantis by adding this language why don't we talk about how you became a linguist what was what was that inspiration at a young age that maybe you had from researching languages or where did that come from uh, well, I don't know where the interest came from. It was probably there in the background all the time, and I didn't know it. But where the idea of, of actually studying linguistics came from was from college. Uh, when I was in college, uh, all, there, it was a brand new school at the time. It was, it was only its second year of operation. And there was a class that all the freshmen had to take the, uh, the, in the first quarter, which was called Language, Culture, and Society, or maybe Language, Society, and Culture. I can't remember which way it went. But anyway, uh, I'm not sure what the faculty had in mind when they when they designed that course. But what it turned out to be was an introduction to the faculty and an introduction to the discipline. So what that means is uh, every week you would be taught by a different professor. The, the, the common thread was language, but the pro- approaches were different. So one week it would be a philosopher and one week it would be a psychologist. and One week it would be literature and one week it would be history and so on. So you got to meet all the different faculty and get a get an idea of what the different disciplines were all about. And the person who spoke, the professor who spoke at the beginning and the end of this stretch was the linguist. There was only one linguist on, on, on campus, on the faculty at the time. And of all the different approaches to language that the different professors talked about, the one that kind of grabbed me the most was linguistics. I'd never heard of studying language in that particular way. I've heard of studying a language to learn how to speak it and read it and write it and stuff like that, but not to analyze it the way the linguist was doing. So after that was over, I took Linguistics 1, or it's, I'm sure that's not it was, isn't what it was called. And that was good. And then I took Linguistics 2, and that was good. And then summer came. And when I came back from summer, they already redesigned the entire linguistics curriculum. And I couldn't take Linguistics 3 because it didn't exist anymore because it got combined with Linguistics 2. And so anyway... They set me up uh, with an independent study. It was just me as a sophomore and the professor working together two, three times a week, which is kind of unusual at that, at that level in college. That's common in a, in a graduate program. Uh, and that's, that's where I got hooked because he had me working on, on real language data, not just textbook you know, designed exercises and things like that. And that, that's, that's where it took. So I just kept pursuing. That's where it started. If we think about it, language is something that is just an everyday thing. You 
talk to somebody. That's how we communicate. We don't really analyze the technicalities of it and how it's different in different regions in the United States. Like for me, I'm here in Philly. We say certain things certain ways. Texas might have it a little bit different and California might be a little bit different. And then across the world, there are certain ways of of saying different phrases, which mean the same thing. But it, it's, it, it translates differently because when I studied Spanish in, in high school, because I took three different courses of that, you know, you could, you could tell that you could understand the translation, but it was, it was different in structure. So sometimes it seems so complicated when you're really analyzing it. And for me, I'm like, you know what? Only the smartest people in the world <laughs> can really grab hold of that because sometimes it's really complicated. Do you, do, were you ever frustrated or w- were there any frustrations that you ever had with, an, you know, analyzing any type of language before? Constantly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, what most of my studies were about after the after the you know preliminary stuff and introductory stuff uh, was American Indian languages, uh, primarily from the West Coast and primarily from California. Uh, and the language I studied the most was spoken not all that far from San Francisco originally, but at the time I studied it, there were zero speakers, so all of the stuff I looked at. Uh, in order to figure out how this language worked was stuff that uh, uh, an anthropologist had written down, you know, 30 years before I got involved or something like that, or missionaries had written it down a couple hundred years before that. Uh, But I couldn't sit down with someone and say, how do you say this? How do you say that? What's the difference between this and this and so on to, to learn it. And that was kind of frustrating from time to time because I'd have on a sheet of paper, I'm not making this stuff up now, you know, how to say, I see, and then on another sheet of paper, it would say, you see, and then another sheet of paper, it would say, say, he sees or she sees, and then another one would say, we see, and none, no piece of paper would say, they see. Wait a minute, where's the rest? It's things like that. I could only deal with what was, you know, what, what I had on the papers in front of me. So there was a lot of holes in what I was doing until by chance, I would turn over another piece of paper. Ah, there's the answer. It's all mixed up with something else, but here it is. So yeah, you know, it was frustrating to not get the data you wanted. For me, it was I wasn't able to ask the questions that I wanted because there was no one to ask them to. Were, were you helping out directly with the cast who had to speak no. the language? No, no, no. Uh, I, I wasn't there when they actually did any of the recording. I'm told they had a, a dialogue coach, or I'm not sure if that was the correct title, mm-hmm. who worked with them. Uh, but I wasn't there. What I did is, is, you know, they gave me the lines in English and I translated them into Atlantean and sent them back in written form. And I also made recordings. Um, and I'm trying to think now this is probably, huh? I can't remember if, if this was done on, on tape or on MP3 files or something like that. It was probably done on tape back then. Do you, do you remember like what year you officially started? Because I know that well, they I, had... I, I, probably, it was four years. I worked on it for four years before the film came out. Oh my goodness! So the film came out what in two thousand two thousand and one? Yeah, two thousand one. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it was four years before that is, is when when I had my first meeting with them. Yeah, what was Which that? Speaks well of the film. I mean, they were so careful and so smart about how they did everything. The the planning that went into this thing was incredible. Uh, but then the first conversation was probably with Don. And the first meeting out there uh, was with, with Don and the two directors. It's two things. One is, is how, the, how does the language work in the film, which I, you know, obviously I didn't know ahead of time in terms of, in terms of speaking. And they explained to me who all the different, we went, they went and basically did it like a, like a pitch. They went around the room and had drawings of the characters and this is so-and-so and this is so-and-so. Uh, and how, how it all fits. So how, you know, who speaks what and who doesn't understand and all that for the spoken. But the main component of Atlantean, actually, the, the, the bulk of it in a film is written. There's a whole lot of written Atlantean on the walls and in the book and, and so on. And there's a lot more of that than there is spoken. So that we, t- we talked about the written language. And at the time, there was no way to write it. They hadn't developed the writing system yet. So among the things we found, I really can't remember now because I was out there, you know, more than once. And I can't remember, you know, which meeting was which and, and all that kind of thing. Um, but the, we talked about the writing system. I remember 
one meeting in this, in this big room. Maybe it was the first one. Huh, can't remember. Anyway, on the wall, they had done research about different uh, writing systems from all around the world. So there was, the whole room was lined, all four walls were lined with examples of different writing systems from all over the place. And of course, they're Disney. <laughs> so they're looking at this from an artistic point of view. And I'm the linguist, and I'm looking at it from a language point of view. And we're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, so I was talking, I said, you know, not every writing system is an alphabet. And they said, what do you mean? So I said, well, in some systems, each character represents a syllable, and some systems, each character represents a word or a part of a word. There's all these different ways of doing it. You know, and some uh, languages are written left to right, and some right to left, and some top to bottom. And, you know, I said, you know, in the, in the early days of writing, in some places, when people were carving in the rocks and stuff like that, you know, uh, they'd start, say, in the upper left-hand corner and go left to right. When they got to the end of the line, they would just drop down. So the next line and go back. So the next line would be right to left. And then they'd drop down and the next line would be left to right. So back and forth and back and forth. And they thought that was pretty nifty. So they decided that the way Atlantean would be written is, is in that style. It's called Lustrophedon, um, which is left to right, right to left, left to right, right to left as you go down uh, through the document. So they, they adopted that uh, as the way to do it. So if you see Atlantean written, it's not left to right, left to right, left to right. It's back and forth and back and forth, which drove the, 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 the people who had to do this crazy. Uh, because when I wrote up the transcript, it was just left to right, left to right, left to right. So they had to reverse everything for, for every other line. What they didn't do is adopt another suggestion that I had which was that the language, the writing system, not be alphabetic. I thought it would be more interesting if it was something else, if it was based on the syllable or something. But they didn't do that. Uh, so the, the, the system they developed uh, was an alphabet. So, you know, this is an A, this is a B, and, and so on and so forth. And the characters that they developed, which you've probably seen, uh, has more letters than they need. They have enough letters that they created to write English, plus a, a, a couple additional characters. Uh, but for Atlantean, you don't need all of them. But they created a one-to-one -one correspondence so you could write English. And at first, I thought, what are they doing? Why, why are they making this alphabet? Has, first, why is it an alphabet? I was a little disappointed that they did that. But I get it now. Because what they wanted to do is you be able to use this system to write stuff other than Atlantean. For example, if you wanted your name written out using these characters, they'd have to have enough characters so they could do that easily, you know, on, on a hat at Disneyland or something like that. So it was a smart idea to make enough, but for that reason, but I was, I was hoping they would do something a little more exotic, from an English point of view exotic, not from a world point of view. I guess I understand like where they were going with that because they, they recently had Milo and Kida meeting and greeting in Disneyland and Walt Disney World. And instead of doing the regular autographs now, they have these cards that are already printed up with their autographs on it. Ah. And Kida's is actually written in Atlantean. It's not spelled K-I-D-A, which is I thought was really cool. I'll send you a picture. I found it okay. online. I think you'll like right. it. <laughs> Do you remember what your thoughts were on some of the the character actors um, working through the Atlantean language to get it correct? Like, what were your thoughts on Cree Summer working as Kida and uh, Leonard Nimoy as the king of Atlantis and Michael J. Fox as Milo? Well, I didn't have any choice about that. <laughs> that was that was it's sort of a done deal. And in making up the language, I wasn't concerned or thinking about the particular actors. I was thinking about the the Atlanteans, you know, and, and where they came from, where their language came from and stuff like that. Although I was really, really pleased that Leonard Nimoy was, was one of the speakers because he was my first, one of my first students, so to speak, when I got involved with, with Star Trek. Uh, initially, it was for Vulcan, not for Klingon. And I had to work with two actors uh, who played Vulcans. Uh, one was, was Kirstie Alley, who played... Um, a female Vulcan character in in Star Trek II, uh, or maybe she was half Romulan. That's confusing. Anyway, uh, and Leonard Nimoy, obviously, who was Spock. 
So, you know, my, my initial entry into this world of making up languages and, and, and all that was with Leonard Nimoy. So when I heard he was going to be the voice again uh, in Atlantis, I thought this is, this is great, you know, because there's some, some continuity there. They tell me a story uh, since I wasn't there when they were doing the recording of the language, they told me a story. I don't know who told me, Don probably, uh, about Leonard Nimoy. When, when I worked with Leonard Nimoy on Vulcan, uh, what the, the job was, was Vulcan initially, what, what I did anyway, was not really a language. It was just sounds. It was definitely gibberish because there was a little scene uh, in Star Trek II where the two characters, Savik and the, 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 the female Vulcan and Spock, uh, have a short little conversation, maybe two lines a piece. And when the actors did it during the filming, they were speaking English because that's what the script said to do. But in post-production, they decided to change it so they were speaking Vulcan. So what I was hired to do was create basically gobbledygook that sounded different but matched the lip movements on the film. And then they would dub it in. And I did it on two, where I worked with the actors on that and on two different days. So one day was with Kirstie Allen, a couple of days later, it was with Leonard Nimoy. With, and with Leonard, uh, after we did it, I, I had to leave. I, was, I had to go off and do something else. And they had a lot of other work to do. But right before I left, he kind of wadded up the piece of paper that had his gibberish Vulcan lines on it. And jokingly threw it at me and said, you know, did anyone tell you you were out of your mind? You know, what a weird thing to do. And, da, da, da. and then I left. And now years later, we're doing Atlantis. And they tell me that when they, Leonard was recording his Atlantean lines, uh, he asked them, well, who, who did this language? Where did it come from? So they said, oh, Mark, Mark Ocran did it. He says, oh, Mark, I know Mark. He's out of his mind. <laughs> Oh, so he remembered you after all he those years. Me, yes. yes. He really loved what he did. Like I that documentary about him. Did you see that? No. Oh, it, it, I think his I think his son worked on it. Oh, it was a little documentary about him. Yeah, okay, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, they they had that wonderful documentary and he was just he really loved what he did and he loved the fans. He treated it very seriously and when he presents as the king in the film, um it it just sounds so like the the performance is so rich and yeah. he's only on screen for like 10 minutes right know? it's not that much at the at the premiere of the film there was two premieres uh with big parties and all that stuff one was in la and one was in new york and i went to the one in new york not to the one in la and different cast members were at different ones so the bulk of the of the of the voice cast was at the one in la and a couple of people who were at the one in New York. And among the people at the one in New York was Michael J. Fox, because he lives on the East Coast. And by chance, where I was sitting, there was, there was little tables, you know, and, and where I was sitting was a couple tables away from where Michael J. Fox was sitting. And I never, I'd never met him before, I think, but I saw him sitting over there. And I said I, I, to myself, I should really go over and meet, take the opportunity and meet him. Uh, so I went over there and introduced myself. And I apologized to him for having, you know, coming up with these lines that we had to, had to cope with in Atlantean. And he said to me, oh, no. He said, your lines were fine. The Atlantean was fine. I was struggling with the English. The Atlantean was great. And, and I'm, I'm not to pat myself on the back because it wasn't my doing. But ever since Klingon came around, uh, which was, it was I mean, it, it, as, as a spoken language, which is for Star Trek III, which I guess was 1984, or something like that. Ever, ever since then, every time there's a uh, in science fiction, you know, outer space uh, species or something, or in fantasy films, you know, there's a strange place, what have you. There's a, there's a language or set of languages that goes along with it. And that wasn't the case so consistently, you know, prior to Klingon. So it's not, you know, that there's nothing about Klingon. There's nothing about the Klingon language that's so wonderful that, <laughs> that it should have 
instigated all of this stuff. You know, Klingon doesn't have fascinating relative clauses, and therefore we're going to have good relative clauses in all the movies from now on. It's nothing like that. But for some reason, ever since then, at least as, 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 as a time stamp, not as, not as a cause, uh, there's, there's more and more of this. You know. Atlant- and Atlantis was one, of, was one of the first ones. Even it was, you know, it was, what, so it was 15 years later or something than all this Klingon stuff. But it was one of the first to really take care to incorporate the language. And it's also in Atlantis. In, in the movie, it's important to the plot. It's not just a, an, a, an also thing, you know, to, to, in, you know, for the Klingons, because the Klingons also all speak English and the Vulcans also all speak English. So you could say that the reason for having Klingon original, the spoken Klingon in the film was to give the Klingon characters uh, uh, some depth and reality and uh, interest and, and things like that, but it wasn't crucial to the plot that they speak Klingon. And that's not true in Atlantis. In Atlantis, the language is crucial to the plot because the whole thing of deciphering the book and, and, and uh, being able to speak to the Atlanteans once they got there and stuff is not, uh, oh, isn't this cool sort of thing. It's a, this is what the, uh, this, this uh, it uh, accelerates the plot. To, 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 you have to figure out what's going on here. With Klingon, uh, right after the, the movie came out, right after Star Trek Three came out, I wrote a book. Well, I wrote it at the same time as the movie was going on, but it came out six months or so after after the movie did, explaining how the language works, uh, the basics anyway, and and uh, a small dictionary. It's grown a lot since then, but so people had a, had a, a starting point to learn the language. With Atlantean, there's no such thing. There's no place. There's no official source, meaning from me or anyone associated with the film, to explain how the language works. Uh, there might be a couple of short little vocabulary lists, perhaps, um, but there's nothing explaining the grammar and certainly no dictionary with all the words that I came up with for the film. So I didn't know until relatively recently that there was a big interest in the Atlantean language. I knew there was in Klingon, but I didn't know there was this big interest in the Atlantean language as well. But there's people who, on their own, it's like, it's like what I did with the, with the, with the uh, Native American language, uh, have tried to figure out on the basis of what they hear in the film and what they've seen in print about trying to figure out how the language works. And they've done a, a They've done a reasonable job. I haven't looked at it that closely to say that it's 100% right or anything like that. But it's amazing uh, what, what they've done. And I've also noticed, you know, this movie was 20 years ago. And there was no, never a sequel. There was a TV sort of thing, maybe, that kind of came and went real fast. But that's it. Um, but all of a sudden, or at least it seems to me all of a sudden, but maybe it's just because I don't know what's going on in the world. In the last few years, there's a resurgence of interest uh, in Atlantis, the film, and also in Atlantean, the language, which is fascinating. You know, and I, I listened to some Atlantean language scenes for the film. You know, years after after having done it, and years after having seen it uh, the first time around, and listened to it, and think, "Wow, <laughs> this sounds pretty good. I did a good job. I was I was impressed with myself." So it, it's it's been 20 years. It's crazy to think that it's that long ago. But is there anything you would like to say directly to the fans? Thank you. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think it's great that, 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 that they're taking it so seriously and that and not not just, you know, learning how to speak it, which is fine, but that they understand the importance of it to the film, to the storytelling and to the development of the characters and things like that. And the fans are the ones who keep all this stuff alive. You know, uh, Disney does whatever they do and they make their, their, their decisions on the basis of whatever they make their decisions on. But the fans are the ones who keep it alive and keep, and keep it going and, and keep it uh, vital. How is my accent? Boorish, provincial, and you speak it through your nose. 